This is the BBC. This podcast is supported by advertising outside the UK. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. You're out. Completely out. Supermarket now. The choice is overwhelming. One ply, two ply, three ply, quilted, recycled, tree-free bamboo, biodegradable, unbleached, reusable. What do you even normally get? All you need is something to wipe your... Welcome to All Consuming with me, Amit Katwala. And me, Charlotte Williams. I'm an entrepreneur and marketing expert. Amit is a science journalist and author. And in this series, we explore our culture of consumption through products that have changed the world. What better use of your enemy's name than for your rear? Today on All Consuming, we're getting to the bottom of the toilet paper industry. We had two litters of puppies. You already find one actor out of each kind of litter, really, (laughs) strangely enough. We're lifting the lid on those panic purchases. It's not based on fear, or not at least not overwhelming fear. So, Amit, let's straighten something out here. Are you a folder or a scruncher? I like to alternate between folding and scrunching, so folding at first and then scrunching if the job requires it. Interesting, I won't go into any more detail there. Now, of course, in the UK today, toilet paper is bog standard. But trust me, Amit... We're living in a golden age when it comes to our bathroom comfort. Interesting. So around 79 AD, when the Romans developed communal bathhouses, a lot of these featured a tersorium, which was a stick with a natural sponge or cloth on one end. And visitors could use the tersorium stick to clean themselves and then pass it on to a neighbour. Sophia Gauche is the author of a history of toilet paper and other potty tools. Occasionally, the Greco-Romans were also using moss or leaves, sometimes seashells, and they were even known to use pieces of broken ceramic pottery, which may have been inscribed with their enemy's name. Ouch. What better use of your enemy's name than for your rear? You know, that's that's sort of how it went back then. I don't know. Now, let's head to ancient China, where around 105 AD, an official of the Han Dynasty is working on an exciting new product. An ancient Chinese man named Tsai Lun, who worked for the emperor during the Han Dynasty, was looking for something to develop that would be easier to write on. And he sort of mixed and mashed old fishing nets and bark and plant waste and rags and developed through this practice what we would consider the closest thing to what we have as modern paper. But Lun's paper wasn't meant for the potty. It was meant for writing and occasionally art. 400 years after Silen's milestone invention, the first accounts of paper for less creative endeavours emerge. By the 1300s, the Chinese were mass-producing thousands of sheets of toilet paper annually. These were large, flat sheets, sometimes as large as two to three feet across, and some may have even been scented. And these, again, were for the royal families. So this was something reserved for the wealthy, and the common folk were still left to use what they could find. And we see, over the course of history, different developments taking place at different times across the globe. In 17th century France, the development of the bidet, which at that time was sort of a glorified wash basin, just sort of a step up from the chamber pot, if you will. And then in 1800s America, outhouses were sort of the wildly popular choice, and these were usually paired with a corn cob, which does not seem to be very pleasant. Corn was easy to grow, plentiful, and used for exactly what you think. With the birth of the printing press, Americans were treated to a new frontier in hygiene. So with the onset of publishing and the popularization of books and magazines, we were able to see folks using paper with the toilet. And this often came in the form of ripping out pages from old books or magazines. The Sears catalog was a popular choice at the time. And then in America, the Farmer's Almanac was another popular magazine. In fact, after uh, some time, the Farmer's Almanac 
started being made with a hole in one corner so it could be hung in the outhouse next to the loo and individuals could read and then wipe in one swipe. Soon enough, innovators were ready with a bespoke product for the bathroom. But Americans weren't quite ready to cast aside their corn and catalogs. From there, modern toilet paper as we know it uh, really didn't come about until about 1857. And this was with an American inventor named Joseph Gaetti. And Gaetti developed uh, flat sheets, and they were just packaged flat paper sheets with his name sort of stamped across them. And he advertised them as medicated paper for the water closet. But this was a time in history when individuals didn't really speak widely about uh, toilet hygiene, let alone go into a, a store or a shop or stop by a cart and, and purchase anything publicly for their rear. So Joseph Gaetti, while he may have had a great idea and concept, it didn't take on at the time. In 1871, American Seth Wheeler developed and patented the first rolled and perforated wrapping paper. And this was for his company, the Albany Perforated Wrapping Paper Company. But by the 1880s, the concept has sort of been transferred to the toilet already and made popular by the Scott brothers. E. Irvin and Clarence Scott, known as the Scott brothers, launched their own rolled toilet paper in 1890, quickly finding success. So this is where it gets a little interesting because in 1891, Seth Wheeler received a second patent and this time it was specifically for rolled toilet paper. So he is who we widely consider the person who developed and invented modern toilet paper. But it was the Scott brothers who were the first to actually popularize it and then they mass produced it. So while Seth Wheeler received the first patent, the Scott brothers were already on a roll so to speak. <laughs> and um, by the 1920s, the Scott Brothers and the Scott Paper Company were the number one toilet paper provider worldwide. Okay, so that sparked so many questions, Charlotte. But my first question is about corn. How exactly was this used? So in agricultural communities, handfuls of straw were often used. But one of the most popular items to use for cleanup was dried corn cobs. They were plentiful and quite efficient at cleaning. I'm also told they were softer on tender areas than you might think. One thing is for sure, and this has absolutely ruined my barbecue this weekend. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I also won't be attending if, if that's what's, <laughs> what's on offer. And that thing about pottery with your enemy's name on it? It seems like a lot of work. Well, there's a modern equivalent to that. Should you wish, you can wipe your rump with Trump, or at least toilet paper with Donald's face on it. And in the interest of balance, you can also get paper with Joe Biden's face. Now, of course, today toilet paper is big business. The annual market is worth over 20 billion US dollars globally. And here in the UK, we spend over 1.3 billion pounds each year. You would think that might guarantee some supply. But of course, there was a time not too long ago when we couldn't get our hands on a roll for love nor money. Tonight at 10, a sharp escalation in the response to coronavirus as the government urges people to make drastic changes. In shops, to their long queues like this one in Sidcup this morning have become a familiar sight. Inside too, empty shelves are common. Tempers are fraying in Australia. Two women have been charged after this fight over toilet roll. Get off that! I just want one pack. No, not one pack. Call the police. I'm calling the police. That sounds like it could be a trailer for a new horror movie. So, so scary. But I'm really interested in what drives consumers to panic buy, and more importantly, why it was toilet paper that was the object of all this consumption. So joining us in the studio is Dr. Paul Marsden, a consultant psychologist whose research strives to better understand consumer behaviour. Paul, thank you for joining us. So obviously we saw during the pandemic a lot of panic buying of toilet paper in particular, but what's going on inside the mind of someone who is panic buying? Well, the first thing to know is not a lot of panic. I mean, panic is when you get immediate, sudden, overwhelming fear. And one of the things we kind of learned from the pandemic is people were buying, they were overbuying, but there's not a lot of panic going on. It's actually quite rational. That's so interesting you say rational. Can you talk us through that? You're in lockdown, you're going to be spending a lot more time at home, so you're going to need more 
toilet tissue. So that's kind of rational. You also, this is probably the first pandemic you've lived in. So it's like, okay, what do I do? And as smart, intelligent human beings, we kind of look to see what other people are doing. And if everybody else is buying it, that kind of makes sense. And then finally, very early in the pandemic, we realized that there was this, uh, um, the bad actors were doing price gouging. They were putting prices up massively. Mm -hmm. So if you kind of think, well, the prices of toilet paper is going to go double, triple, I better buy it now. So it's pure, it's really rational behavior um, to actually overbuy. And it's not based on fear, or not at least not overwhelming fear. How much of it is driven by the media that people are consuming? Is it the media's fault by because they run pictures of people with trolleys stacked full of toilet roll? Yeah, I mean, there is the phenomenal what uh, media uh, media research is called uh, media amplification. So, yes, it, it does. It seems to be this around social media, particularly Im images going around. But it's, again, as social creatures, we learn from other people. And so we learn from both the, the media, what's telling us, and, and social media. And that can accentuate and accelerate this overbuying phenomenon. But why do you think toilet paper was the product that people were going out to buy so heavily? The, the evidence seems to suggest it's because toilet paper is actually bulky purchase, and so you actually see it disappearing from the shelves. So it's actually more visible. It's a more visible cue. That, oh, it's running out rather than something, something that's small. So that tends to, to run. And once it could have been anything, but once it tends to run, it can, then gets amplified um, o over and over again. The other big insight that we had from looking at people's consumer consumption behavior during the pandemic is that it, a lot of behavior seems to bear out the theory of retail therapy, which is kind of when you shop for your own well-being. You kind of like, it's not what you buy that's important, it's kind of how you buy it. And we know that retail therapy works when you get a sense of you take back control over your environment you know in this pandemic everything's changing you don't know what's going to happen and actually just by buying something you're kind of like okay i'm doing something positive it can be completely random but you, you are taking back some kind of control once these things kind of start they're quite difficult to stop and toilet paper manufacturers were saying you know we've got plenty of toilet paper to go around you don't need to panic buy don't worry that message clearly didn't get through but <laughs> that's, it's the worst thing that you can do we know this and mm. now there are almost jokes made about you don't need to panic buy what's the first thing people are going to panic yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. like do, do not use the p word i mean yeah, it's yeah. just like it makes absolutely no sense so I, I, we you know we've learned a lot through the pandemic and one is that you know that you can the way that you you frame it is is not by saying you don't need to panic buy because the first reaction is that people end up going to some kind of panic or alarm saying this is this is going to go, going going to run out but actually we also know that the more that you give details saying we got new stock coming in and you actually give people details that, that actually that can help attenuate any kind of overbuying so paul as a as a consumer psychologist i'm interested in what your approach was in the early days of the pandemic were you out there you know armfuls of uh, toilet paper under each arm rushing out the supermarket what was you what was your approach to consuming I, that <laughs> I just went into kind of experiment i just went out and watched that's interesting that, that that's going but what we know from previous examples of what was pre you know, previously called panic buying over purchasing that it was actually short term this idea of panic buying has been going on for a long time so in 1973 johnny carson on the tonight show said that there was an issue with toilet paper supplies and even though the manufacturers at the time were like no that's not right there's loads of toilet paper there was a whole issue with panic buying and this was 50 years ago there is an acute shortage of, of toilet paper in the good old united states we gotta quit writing on it <laughs> The false alarm sent Carson's audience of almost 20 million running. I'm used to being able to go when I want to, when I want to, but suddenly I think I'm going to have to start curbing my habits. A Scott spokesman said unfounded rumors of a shortage has caused excessive demand at retail outlets. Carson issued a clarification of sorts. All my life as an entertainer, I don't want to remember the man who created a false toilet paper scare. Apparently there is no shortage. As long as we've been learning from other people's behavior, there's been these runs on things and you can then create a, um, the, 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 you get a snowball effect where then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And I think that's the, the final thing or the, the, the key thing in um, what we've learned about over-purchasing is that you can actually create and generate uh, a problem with supply by simply talking about mm. it and whilst there would have been there wouldn't have been one had you not talked about it so it becomes this self-fulfilling prophecy you talk about uh, there's a run on toilet paper then you kind of create that even yeah. if there isn't 
thank you so much, Paul. It's been so great to get you on the show and for you to share your insight. Thank you very much to Dr. Paul Marsden. Thank you very much. So, Amit, earlier we heard about one of the first forms of modern toilet paper being marketed as medicated. Back in the 1890s, the British company Newton, Chambers & Co. introduced the country to its disinfectant made from distilled coal tar. It was called Isal. The company branched out into loo roll, coating the sheets with their specially medicated disinfectant. These rolls appeared in hospitals, schools and public buildings up and down the country. And although by the 60s, most Brits had gone soft on toilet tissue in their own homes, Isal remained the paper of choice for government-funded establishments for years. Hello, I'm Dr Alice White. I'm a historian and digital editor at Wellcome Collection, uh, which is a museum in London. So we still see hard toilet paper in these places right up to the 1970s and beyond. In the 1970s, the British Civil Service are only just beginning to consider whether they switch to soft toilet paper. Um, And one of the reasons behind that, frankly, is cost. So we have an estimate from the Directory of Supply uh, that the annual bill for toilet paper would increase from £370,000 to a million pounds. A million pounds in 1970 is equivalent to 17 million pounds today. So they had to be pretty sure the switch was worth paying for. Dr Daniel Thompson, who's a member of the Civil Service Medical Advisors Office, asks his friend and fellow club member, Sir Graham Wilson of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, to investigate whether newfangled soft paper would do as good a job as the hard paper that they were currently using that was a lot cheaper. And Sir Graham Wilson took his job very seriously and went to extreme lengths to determine which paper worked best. We have this most amazing report in our archives um, that talks about how he looked at them closely under the microscope, put a drop of water on different samples and saw how long that would take to absorb. Some of his hard toilet paper took two hours to absorb one drop of water. (laughs) But the one that really captured me that I sort of went back to my desk and and couldn't believe I'd just been reading about was the porosity test, which involved him pressing a finger onto the paper with a stool sample underneath and then putting his finger in a Petri dish to see whether germs had come through the paper onto his finger and then onto the Petri dish. And basically, (laughs) Wilson concludes that too much poo comes through the paper on soft paper and until people can be trusted to wash their hands this is not safe so not only is it not cheap enough it's not safe enough for institutions like schools and prisons and hospitals we could be making people poorly wow he really got down and dirty excuse the pun with that one. Um, He took that, I think, a little bit too seriously. I'm really glad things have moved on since those days because here are some comments online from a Facebook page of people who have fond or maybe not quite so fond memories of using Izal. The word ouch makes quite a few appearances and quite a few people are saying it had a dual use as tracing paper. Mm, Handy. One person has written, one side was shiny like greaseproof paper and the other side was rough and fibrous. Neither side was particularly good at doing its job as the shiny side was slippery and the rough side was torturous on the sensitive region. (laughs) Delightful. Isal, very much etched in the memories of those of a certain age. Now, Anna, if I asked you to name an animal associated with toilet paper, what comes to mind? So there's a few I can think of, often quite cuddly, cute animals, but there's definitely one advertising campaign that stands out. This brand who dominated this £600 million market with about a 35% share, so over £200 million at that time, it's quite a big brand. It had begun to lose relevance to its core consumer base. Paul Duncanson has worked in marketing for over 40 years, and from 1990 to 1993, Paul worked as a marketing manager for Andrex. Toilet tissue is, is, as you can imagine, it's a bulky product. Imagine how much space that takes in a supermarket. And space is absolutely key in terms of profit delivery to retailers. Let's talk about the most iconic Andrex TV advert that ever existed, (laughs) I would say, um, which was the boy on the toilet and the puppy (laughs) running away with toilet paper until the roll is empty. So you you helped with the launch of that. Can you tell me about how the concept of the advert was devised? I mean, you're right. That was 
the most powerful advertisement I think Andrex have ever had, possibly from the beginning. We kind of looked, we defined, to cut a long story short, it was a long story, it took us nearly a year to develop this ad, by the way. Um, we identified that talking about the quality of our product over and over again wasn't going to hack it anymore. It wasn't making people feel emotionally attached to our product. So that was that was the situation that created the brief to say, okay, we need an advertising campaign that tugs on the heartstrings of our consumers and that brings our brand back into relevance and, and creates that extra something, that 5% of warmth that I want that brand, I feel that brand. Hello, boy. The team gathered at Shepparton Studios for the shoot, including the film crew, advertising agency execs, vets, and of course, the puppies. We had two litters of puppies. The reason was they you only find one actor out of each kind of litter, really, <laughs> strangely enough. They always have to look like each other as well. You have a small window of filming because if you find a puppy that could work with the boy, um, It'll last for about five minutes, ten minutes, and, the, and then the puppies all go to sleep. We got there, but the great thing about that ad was the end. Mom! And the last bit wasn't scripted, but it was incredibly important in the popularity of the ad. Soft and strong and long. Andrex. Mom! And that, strangely enough, was really important. So we just, it's one of those moments you look at it and think, wow. It's just one word, but it was it, it, it just brought the whole ad back in. Anyway, it worked, is all I can say. Can I ask, why the puppy? Where did the puppy actually come from? When the advertising was launched at the time, I think it was about 20 years before I was there, the puppy was used in place of a child or children. And the reason for that was that when, when Andrex was started and when the first advertising uh, was created, there was a storyboard and ad with a child messing around with Lou Roll, wasting it, and that was deemed as, as encouraging waste and, and not a great idea. The Advertising Standards Authority at the time deemed that so. So the advertising team looked at, well, what, what new money can we have to carry that message? Well, what about if a puppy was kind of messing around with Lou Roll? Well, that's great because it's very difficult to explain that to a puppy, if you like, and <laughs> puppies don't really watch television. Beside undeniably creative marketing, Andrex is also credited with the introduction of two-ply toilet paper in 1942 and the first moist toilet tissue in 1992. However, wet wipes have turned out to be a bit of a disaster for our sewers. Southwest Water has removed what they've described as a monster fatberg from a sewer in Plymouth. More and more we're finding that it's wet wipes that people have flushed uh, down the toilet. So the advice is, if it's not pee, poo or toilet paper, then it shouldn't be going down the toilet. The three Ps. What a perfect way to end this episode. Next time on All Consuming, we're giving you something to chew on in an unexpectedly meaty episode. We're looking into plant-based products. 